All right. Yeah. And and I know you're going to go forward. Uh, the one that just closed was that accredited? Four D colleges? No, that no. was not an accredited. Not accredited. Institution. Okay. No. May I respond to the question about what to in the period after CSAVE stop their participation of veterans, which would be August 2014. From then until April 16th, we worked hand in glove with Heald College and two representatives from Corinthian to try to effect a sale of that asset to another organization. So our, we deemed them appropriately accredited and tried to transfer that ownership from Corinthian to another party. All right, my, my question, and you just said it, that you guys accreditate all, all of them, correct? For, for the private, the, the, the state, and all of that, correct? Any, any degree granting four year or above institution in the region, including California, uh, that uh, wishes to be accredited, we accredit. Okay, now, now with that, that means all those classes go back and forth. Correct. So if you're accredited, you take a class here mm -hmm. at a for-profit school. That class is then able to use at, say, another university or UC. So what we require of because when as a student, right, and as a veteran who's recently been through this, and I sit on the. National Veterans Fraternity Board, this is near and dear to me, mm -hmm. we have tons of students that take classes at an accredited institution who then transfer over to another UC or CSU, and those credits that are accredited do not transfer, and these students have already spent two years of their GI Bill funds and now have to retake two years' worth of school out of their own pockets. Mm -hmm. So what we require is that institutions post in clearly understandable terms what the transfer policies are that they will take in from other institutions. And if they have what's, what's called articulation agreements, which exists primarily between community colleges and four-year colleges. And what that means is that there's a direct path where there are such agreements that if a student starts in a two-year institution and does that coursework, they seamlessly go into the four year and they don't lose and, anything. And ma'am, I agree with that. It, it, yeah. My point is if you're accredited, you're accredited and it should go across the board. Not, I have an agreement here with this university, but mm -hmm. not an agreement with this school and this university. Yeah. The, the point is, is if it's accredited, it should be good everywhere you go. That's what accredited means. It's, it's a stamp, it's a seal of approval. And by it only working, with these partnerships versus these partnerships, this is how we're in the mess that we're in with so many veterans who are struggling to get by. Thank you. So, so for the, are, are they whole campuses that don't have these, um, these articulation agreements then, or is it certain classes that are not transferable? Each, each institution creates its programs as it deems to be fit. So you may have an English program at one institution that's going to be a little different than the English program at another institution, depending on what that institution's mission is, goals are, specific students' philosophy it may be. Um, so they're both good programs, but they're a little bit different. So this is one of the challenges with the transfer credit. Um, if, an, if a student starts at one institution and continues there, everything is fine. If that student goes to another institution and those faculty have determined that program at that institution to need something a little bit different, they may not recognize that even though these courses are good courses from another institution, they don't fit into that program in the same way because those programs are going to be a little bit different. Those things are the institutional discretion, how they define their programs, how they define their learning outcomes. And I, I agree, it is a challenge for students. There are about 40, almost 40% 40 of students transfer at least once in their educational careers. And trying to minimize the extent to which they would lose credit in making that move, I think is something that all institutions are very aware of and wanting to do. I think a lot of institutions will then try, if it doesn't fit into a certain program, to give um, 
to give a credit for it in another way so that they don't actually lose the credits altogether. Uh, but depending on where the switches are and if they're changing a major or something, it, there, there, may be, there may be a loss there. Mr. Frazier. Thank you. So let's back up to history when you started out. Who, uh, your agency, who is the funding mechanism for uh, your agency and what kind of employees, like we asked uh, CSAVE, uh, what kind of employee base do you have on, uh, and is your uh, employee base big enough to, to carry the workload? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, 25 staff members. Um, we are, uh, as all, are all creditors, uh, private uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, our funds come from the membership. They pay dues, and they we are, they're charged fees for specific so processes, the non, et cetera. So the, the for-profit people pay you to give them accreditation? They pay to be members of the organization through which, indeed, they have access so, to the accreditation processes. So yeah. is there any kind of conflict there because they're paying you to accredit mm -hmm. them? Um, that question has been raised before. We do not see that as a conflict because the members have agreed that they will come together and fund themselves. For, do they yes. ever say, do they ever uh, protest? Uh, and is, do they have an appeals process that says, we don't agree with you, we're paying you? We now, let me take that back to earlier in your question. Are they allowed, a for-profit institution, to choose the members of the teams that review them? No. Are they allowed to choose the chair? No. May they appeal, like any other institution, a commission decision? Yes. Do they sit on that decision-making process? Do, Do they have members of that organi uh, the for-profit world mm -hmm. sitting in that, uh, that Are they process? on the commission, our governing yes. board of directors? Yes. There is, at the current time, one? One president. Of one the one president. So, yes, sir. so with your workload, that we've defined, you have 25 employees, mm -hmm. uh, and based on the amount of uh, material that you have to look at, are you do you consider yourselves uh, done? Have you done that well, where you have enough people to 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 carry the workload? I would say now we are appropriately staffed. Um, as you may know, with recent changes uh, in the state of California and requirements for all degree granting institutions to be accredited uh, by July 1st, 2020, uh, we do anticipate that we're going to have uh, a number of institutions that on a relatively short timetable are going to um, need to be applying for and have already filed plans with BPPE to do this, um, that they will be coming to us. So we are, we are looking at that carefully to make sure that we can provide the service to those institutions that's needed. And I just have one more question. Um, both the U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Veterans Affairs have real customer measures, uh, but they ignore each other, making them basically ineffective. Does uh, WASAC look, at, look to make sure that colleges have students who are judging educational value without federal or state money? For example, I have uh, seen charts of the U.S. Department of Education that show that when you combine VA and ED funds, uh, uh, Argosy University, which you accredit, gets more than 85% of its revenue from those two sources alone, not including Cal grants. So do you examine how colleges may uh, be combining various sorts of taxpayer sources in order to end up with zero real accountability in terms of educational value for the money? We do want to make sure, and we have um, certain forms that must be filled up for our teams to make sure that institutions are within the boundaries of, of federal compliance of what the federal government requires. Um, and there is a federal requirement, and the federal government has responsibility in that regard as well. So as I asked the uh, people from CSAVE, is there a wish list that your organization had to protect all students? All students. Uh, on these default rates or the, uh, the ability to damage uh, students going forward with, and they have a heavy recruiting process and make promises that they can't fulfill or won't fulfill. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a wish list that you'd like to be able to supply the, the chairs of higher ed and the veterans committee to be able to strengthen your position uh, going forward so that you can actually provide more protection? Um. We do look at uh, the recruitment marketing and where the expenses are going at institutions to make sure that um, they are appropriately 
allocating their resources to serve students and that they have an appropriate mix of the, those recruitment personnel and faculty and student support services and all the other things that, that are there. So I think I do think that we have that. Um, my wish list would be that uh, we had some way, and we are looking at this, this is something that, that we want to discuss further with the commission, that we had some way to um, improve our oversight so that we could we could touch those parents of the publicly traded. I mean, I think it was referred to before that 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 it's it's well known that the for profit it's not one big group that are all the same. There are four benefit corporations. There are limited partnerships. They're publicly traded. All those kinds of things. What we have seen with the particularly with the large publicly traded institutions is that we we cannot reach that parent corporation in a way, although it has tremendous authority over the institution and effect on the institution, um, to try to find some way to change that so that we can have that have some, something closer to uh, oversight, even though we do not and cannot accredit those, because all we do is accredit de degree-granting institutions, they're not institutions. Yeah. So that would be my wish list, to, to be able to, in some way, more closely have oversight um, so that we have more information about what's going on there and have closer ties with the Department of Education when the Department of Education is considering something like putting an institution on, on heightened cash monitoring, that we're aware of that, that there can be conversations because these are students that we're talking about. And as you've seen with, uh, with HEALD, um, when those decisions are made and that institution closes, there are thousands of students that are affected by that. And we did our best and do our best to serve those students. But we are always constantly aware of the fact that, and this is why accrediting decisions are so difficult sometimes, when you see certain uh, metrics um, of graduation rates or cohort default rates, closing an institution based on a metric or a bright line is going to have that effect on a lot of students. So how do we balance that to make sure that we are protecting those students while being concerned about those those issues of less than the most stellar quality, helping those institutions to improve and helping them have the, the resources as far as our professional help um, to do that. And that's a balancing act that we and have. And I appreciate that. I, and I think those are all worthy uh, steps moving forward. I think my biggest concern is that there is a funding issue that could be considered a conflict of interest. And I'd like to look at that uh, going forward to, to make sure that you actually have the ability to distance yourself from people that you are accrediting that are paying for the accreditation. Mm -hmm. So it, it just seems like it's really a heavy kind of, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's not good. And so I want to be able to make sure that we look at that uh, going forward because I think it, it, it is a conflict to me. And so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things I'd like to ask. One is earlier someone said, um, um, that they have the ability to reapply for accreditation once it's taken out. And then in your um, handout, it says that um, Hield College was uh, permanently closed. They could so kind of tell us, and I know you're two different panels speaking, but can they reapply for accreditation? or can, are they permanently out of business? That institution no longer exists. So if they wanted to reconstitute themselves and then come back and apply after a certain period of time, they could do that. It would be a, it would be a very lengthy process. I think it would be really helpful if I may, may ask that Christopher Oberg talk a little bit about the specifics. I think it will be instruction, instructive to hear what we did, how we did it, and, and where, where there were challenges in that regard. So I, I would like to hear that, but okay. I don't know if we have... Uh, enough time okay and that's why I was very All right. did you have another question I, no the um, the other question I think uh, had to do with um, if in fact military people move around mm -hmm. and um, and they're um, going to different schools for example is there some kind of way we can standardize accreditation is there any way at all that we can do that and I don't mean you know you're with with um, the community colleges that you have uh, um, uh, an articulation with them, but is there a way that that can be done? Because this happens not just in the for-profit schools that we're talking about now, but as you said earlier, it happens with community colleges mm -hmm. and 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 going on to the four-year universities. Is there any way that accreditation can be standardized? 
can we draw the distinction between two types of accreditation? What we do is regional institutional. And one of the major reasons institutions seek it is because then they know that their students have a very high probability of being able to transfer to another. But then there are national or programmatic accreditors which accredit only a single course of study. And how they come together so they, they could transfer those in is a whole other question outside of what we do. But the 180 and the 40 approximately that are interested in our accreditation, mm -hmm. one of the reasons for seeking it is to assure that students have that capacity to move among member institutions. I think the only way to really make that happen would be to standardize uh, the institutions of higher education that we have so that they all do the same thing in the same way, which kind of goes counter to what we've been so proud of in this country, that we have a diversity of higher education institutions that aren't all the same, that one will be a good fit for a certain student and another will not be a good fit for a certain student. But it does create that problem of if you move from institution to institution, you are going to be seeing a little bit of a difference between those institutions, and that may affect what can be transferred. Well, while we're talking about that transfer, and when you were talking about they accredit um, one program in the school, I think that that may have been what happened with 4D Academy, and that is in my district. I'm really concerned because we just found out this morning that, um, that that happened. However, we've been working with that school to try to help them to get past that, um, past the point. It was something that we couldn't do anything about because it's a federal issue. Hmm. However, I just wanted to put that on the record because Mr. Medina keeps saying that the school was closed. And now I understand with that one program, and that's what I was understanding, that it was one program that they had that um, took the whole school down. Hmm. I'm, uh, we are a little bit um, short on time. We want you to stay up there. I'm going to ask uh, Joanne Wenzel from the um, BPPE to come up and sit with you so we can address questions to um, all three of you. And we'll give you, a, um, we'll give you a chance to make a brief statement after we have a couple of additional questions. So, Mr. Mathis. Ma'am, I just want to go to your point, and I agree with you in the fact of, you know, there are different universities across the country. Everybody's there to compete with different programs. I think the basis of this comes down to those core classes um, that students have to get. I mean, you, you go through, you have your rubric, you have your block, hey, you have to take, you know, pick your class within this block to cover these, and you need, you know, so many units from here or credits from here. Right. That's where that standard accreditation across the board needs to come into play, because those are the classes, those are those are the core classes that students take, and a lot of students, especially military, will you know they'll be stationed over here for six months or a year, and they'll take some classes at a university or a community college or what have you that are deemed accredited, and then they'll move to another location and do the same, and then by the time they get done with their service and circle around and go, you know what, maybe it's time for me to move to my bachelor's or my master's, they look back and those higher universities go, well, we don't count those credits because they're not accredited, even though they were. And it gets into the agreements that you talked about and things like that, and I think that is the basis of this problem, is we say, okay, you're accredited. But you go back to that core rubric of these are the courses you have to take. And, I mean, this is stuff as simple as English 101 mm -hmm. and, and stats and math and algebra. And I'm sorry, but, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And if you can't be accredited across the board on that or this is the basic format of a paragraph or this is how you write a sentence, then we have some severe issues. Um. To solve this, you would have to go to the faculty. The faculty are the ones that decide what counts and what doesn't count. Faculties at the different institutions are the ones that I think the foundational thing you're talking about, the general education core of what and every institution has to have that. No, I understand that. Right. I, I know the full process on that. Right. I actually helped with um, my community college within accreditation process in their uh, review. However, it's 
it, what I'm seeing is it's it's pointing the fingers and it's passing the buck and it's going, oh, well, it's here, the problem's here, the problem's here. The fact is, is that there's a problem and it comes down to certain core classes aren't accredited the same across the board and it's affecting everybody. And there are certain for-profits who, in order to meet their equation formula balance on their sheets, target veterans because it's a separate funding source that's outside of their 9010 formula. And because the accreditation process says, oh, well, we're accredited, and it goes to, you know, Assemblyman Fraser's comments, you know, they're they're paying to make sure that they're accredited and that there's just tons and tons of problems there that need to be addressed and need to be taken care of to ensure that you know, as far as I'm concerned, GI Bill funds or you know, any other funds from military to go to college should fall under that same equation anyway, because it's federal money that's getting paid. But more to the point, if these guys are going to take a class, it needs to count and not be a separate thing. And, and to go back and go, oh, well, the faculty here said this, or, well, this college said this, or, well, there's an agreement here, but there's not an agreement there. It's a tit for tat, and soldiers are bearing the burden, and they're paying the cost, and they ultimately end up getting screwed in the outcome. I just, before we go to the Bureau and statement, I, I just want to um, ask just a couple of real quick questions. How often is a school, how often does a school lose accreditation in WASC? Because they're talking about some conflicts about members. And then should HEALD have been accredited? Now, you said HEALD met all the metrics, but perhaps the metrics are not right. Perhaps there should be other metrics. Um, perhaps we're looking at the wrong things. But uh, I was wondering if you could just answer those two questions before we got our statement from the Bureau. Um, I, I was stuck on the second one, and I forgot the first question. I'm sorry. Could you say, say again? How, how many schools have lost accreditation? Oh, um, lost? not that many schools have lost accreditation. Um, we are more careful about letting institutions in that do not meet eligibility criteria, and quite a few institutions that have come to us and asked to, to get into the pipeline for, for accreditation we have said you don't do it or they go through that process and, and don't get in. Um, and nationally, I think it's about 50% of institutions that, that applied in the past were not eligible for accreditation. Once they're in, uh, we do work with them to make sure that those students are protected and they continue to improve um, when it is the case that institutions really are out of compliance without any chance of after giving them due process and giving them the opportunity to improve uh, that, they, that they are not and do not have prospect of becoming uh, coming into compliance, uh, they lose their accreditation. But you would like it, the accreditation, uh, I, I understand you want to protect the students, but if the door closes, if the school closes, then, then there's a much bigger mess than, than um, losing accreditation. Yes. Okay, so then just if you could just answer the... The second uh, the question, second should question. should Heald College have been accredited? Yes. Right, I, and I understand you've said it met all the metrics, but, I mean, in, in your mind, should it have been accredited, and how should the metrics be changed so a Heald College isn't accredited? Yes, Heald College should have been accredited. Should Corinthian, could we have reached into Corinthian and figured out what they were doing behind the scenes? That's what we need to do. We need to, as Mary Ellen said earlier, we have to have a mechanism that allows us to reach up into the parent entity of, for, of publicly traded companies to understand how they may be taking actions that threaten the health of the institution we accredit. Please note that all of the USDE accusations against Corinthian, not one of them had to do with academic excellence or the production of their, their, the su success of their students. So, the, yes, the institution should have been accredited. So you just said it. You, what would your plan, how, how would you see, what is needed to, as you said, reach up and look into these things? What, what is the process? What needs to be laid out so that way we can move forward and make sure that there is the ability to do so? You're the one that said it. Obviously, you've thought of, hey, if we do X, Y, and Z, this is how we can ensure that this doesn't happen. So what is the X, Y, and Z, sir? You want to take it from a commission level? Or? 
You have to do X, Y, and Z, so in, in there's powers to ensure that the accreditations are met, that these things don't happen again. You know, I w- one of the things I look back on, and I mean, I graduated Fresno State in 2013, so I'm the most recent member of the state legislature out of the university system. With that, when you're looking at these things, in looking at the courses that I recently took, and you look at the predictions of the next, you know, big recession, the next economical crisis, is these for-profit universities going to bust because the accreditation process fails, just like this happened. And my concern is that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that we're going to have more of these fail, and we're going to go into an even bigger economical downturn due to this. And you guys knowing what the X, Y, Z is on how to ensure that these things don't happen, this needs to be met. We need to have these discussions, and I believe that's part of the reason why you all are here. And the answer of, well, we need to go back and talk to our board, I understand that for political reasons and how that works. But going back to the board, we need to have the discussion. We need to have it now, and that's why you all are here. 